All right, hello and welcome. My name is Andrew Sheets. I am the communication manager here at Frameline and I'm so excited to be uh, moderating this discussion with the team behind Shit and Champagne, uh, which is having its world premiere at Frameline 44, September 17th at the West Wind Solano Drive-In. Um, we've got a uh, real cast of characters here and I'm very excited to introduce them. So if we can get them up on screen. Very cool. Um, I, <laughs> um, I love you all so much and think so highly of you. And I really want uh, to go around, have you introduce yourselves. Don't be modest. You're all amazing. Um, if we can start with Darcy, who's the writer, creator, producer, director, star of, uh, of the film and then make our rounds, that would be awesome. It's not a vanity piece, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, uh, my name is Darcy Drollinger. Um, I wrote, uh, directed, produced, and starred in both the stage production and the film. Chef Shit and Champagne. I'm Nancy. I'm, I play Debbie, the deadbeat stripper, and I was also in the stage productions, both at Rebel and Oasis, and yeah, happy to be here. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, how about Matthew? Matthew? I'm Matthew. Hi, hi everybody. Hi out there. She's so shy today. <laughs> well, I know I'm a moment. I'm Matthew Martin, and I play Dixie Stampede, and so delighted to be here, and uh, having done it on stage and bringing it to the screen is a dream come true. So proud of and happy for Darcy, especially all of us. Uh, I'm Stephen LeMay. I play Brandy, the adopted half stepsister <laughs> and, and, and world famous calf model. <laughs> so, um, yeah, And I was also in the Rebel production and the Oasis production as well. And it's just, it's great to finally be able to see this though. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> Hey everybody, I am James Arthur M. I play Champagne's uh, gay BFF Sergio. Uh, I joined the cast uh, when we when we started doing it at Oasis, and then it just took off. So um, here we are. Now we're making movies. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, and that kind of sets us up to where I want to start. I would love to start kind of at the beginning of this project. Um, we're saying that it's, it, you know, started stage and now it's making its its screen premiere. So Darcy, do you want to start at the very beginning for us and, and talk about how sh the story of Champagne White first kind of came into fruition for you? Well, you know, it started kind of as a response to working on the show where I had to do so much compromising and it was so intense with so many cooks in the kitchen. I, I thought I want to write something that I think is funny. And also it was the first time that I wrote something for myself. So I think it was for me as a writer, it was, um, it was, it was a first time. Um, we originally did it in New York at a little, um, strip club called the Slipper Room in the Lower East Side. We'd open the show at eight, we'd be done by 9.30 and the strippers would start at 10. And um, that that ran for about nine months. And it, you know, so at that point it was sort of one of my bigger hits of all the shows that I had done. And then when I moved back to San Francisco, we'd been doing other shows at Rebel and we decided to bring shit and champagne to the stage and I pulled together a cast and we did it at Rebel and got extended twice. Um, and really this cast just clicked. There was some amazing energy in that room during those performances that there, there grew this kind of crazy cultish audience, they called themselves the shitheads, it would come over and, over <laughs> and, over with us. and it became very much like a Rocky Horror situation. Um, and then we, when, when Heckling and I opened the Oasis, we decided to make this the inaugural show there. James joined the cast and, you know, we were rehearsing this show in the middle of a construction zone, right? Like stepping over boards and dirt and puddles of water. And, and I think that really bonded this group of people in this, uh, a deeper way. It was like, 
we were on an episode of you know Naked in the Woods or whatever that show is. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, naked and afraid. Oh no. Anyway, <laughs> in those days, in this in the, in the original show, we only had six actors, so everyone doubled and tripled characters except for me and Matthew. Um, though in the sequel, Matthew did do some other characters as well. Yeah, there are actually two sequels to this, so get ready for those. Um, and then when you know, it was almost written as if it was a um, a film that was being adapted for stage with all the Foley sound effects and yeah. the low budget effects of trying to make <laughs> like a movie. So it really felt, it made sense to make this the first time film, you know, the first film that I was going to do. And I, I do want to say real quick that when I originally wrote it, you know, I was basing this sort of on the the formula of a lot of those exploitation films, Coffee, Foxy Brown with Pam Greer, Savage Streets with Linda Blair, those kinds of things. And looking at those, a lot of times they would get these women addicted to heroin and then enlist them into a prostitution ring, which sort of <laughs> was the plot. But heroin didn't seem very funny. And I was reading in The Village Voice and Michael Musto had a column um, about how the nightclubs were having sewage problems because people were doing booty bumps and shooting crystal meth up about shitting their pants and flushing their underwear down the toilet. <laughs> and so I thought, well, booty pump sounds a little more funny than heroin. And so I blame Michael for um, for that aspect. Of, well, well, and all the club goers. <laughs> the <pants laughs> <and the underwear. laughs> so there's my the star that's, was how born. It, that's how it got to film. And it's interesting, you know, uh, a lot, it's so much, it, it, we spend so much time filming it, but about, I'd say 45 minutes to an hour got on the cutting room floor. But what really made it 90% of that was what was the stage show. So I feel like by do us doing it over and over, we, over a hundred times we did this show, we really got it succinct, you know? Absolutely. And I'm so yeah, I mean, people brought these characters to life. I can't imagine them as any other people at this point. Yeah, as an audience member and big fan of the, there have been, there were three stage iterations before the um, before the film, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I, I mean, as an audience member, I always was like, the kind of bringing the film to stage was very was very obvious. And now it's kind of like making that full circle. Um, and I, I definitely want to talk about how the experience was different for all of you. Um, when you have all of this, because on stage, right, uh, you you kind of are having the thrill of like, this is my moment, I need to nail it now. And if not, it's still hilarious, the audience loves that. But like having this kind of setup where you can cut, you can do all the stuff, you can add, uh, you know, special effects that you're not able to on stage. So I'm curious, like, what what about moving this to, to filming, um, what doors did that really open up to you that you that you felt like the stage show might have been limiting you to? I think it was it was a definite uh, pivot, um, as Darcy has coined the phrase of "that's what we do here, we pivot." Um, <laughs> it was such a different shit because the audience is really the uh, you know seventh cast member, and so I uh, so much of what we do feeds off of the audience energy, and so uh, I think we were really learning as we were going. At least I know for myself, I was, which is I'm really excited for the sequel. But you know, um, the way things work. On film, it's sort of different the way that comedy sort of uh, works. So you can sometimes be sometimes a little bit more subtler or you, you don't have to be as big, but at the same time, the show is really big. So it's such a sort of like formula to sort of um, figure out. And also, the theatrical production was such a ragtag. It was us. Like we were doing our costume changes. Like we would have 30 seconds to become a whole new character. I think in the sequel, some of us played like six different characters. It was just like <laughs> bananas. And so it was sort of weird because like there were all these other people like in our world. So it was definitely like an adjustment. It was like, wait, oh, you're gonna help me do my hair and my costume, or oh, I'm just playing one character. Like in some ways, it was like kind of like not as like the adrenaline wasn't there as much, but also kind of a relief to like, oh, I can just focus on this one 
uh, person. So I do hope for next time that we can like have more time to like do some like rehearsals to sort of like figure out like how does this transition in film. But I think the cast is so talented that we were just, you know, learning and make and go adjusting on the fly. So I think it'll be interesting to see how that sort of translates. But the shitheads love what we do and it's such a cult like <laughs> You can't do shit in champagne wrong because it's so, you know, big and over the top. And, you know, we don't have to do like the Darcy, like uh, the Darcy school of acting of like, say the line, look at the audience, you know, very vaudeville. So, which is a plus. I love the Darcy school of acting. I've learned and grown so much. But. <laughs> there was a, it's funny, you know, there was a, there was a day early on in the filming where I was just screaming my lines and finally someone came, the assistant director came to me and said, you know, you can whisper and we can still hear you. And I was saying, the idea of whispering, I'm used to having to compete with the like the shakers and the soda guns and like the drunk bachelor party. So um, not having those on the film set made it a very different experience. It's also I will say it was a little bit like, you know, is this thing on? Like, do they get our humor? Is this funny? Because it's a whole bunch of like, Right. straight young people who'd never seen the show working on the crew so many people strangers and i'm you know like walking around and they're i don't know i'm like no this is a character and <laughs> you'll see, you'll see. <laughs> and i think it was like you know the end of the first day when it was the two sound guys that were really cool because they were really quiet and i don't know and they were just like you're funny you're like, yeah. like yeah, they like you. and i was like okay it's 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 translating somewhat <laughs> but it felt a little bit like, like two uh, worlds, was, like two worlds were meeting, and we were like, "Just trust us. This is fun. People think this is funny, <laughs> but without that audience reaction, it's it's you know, you're just like, I'm just gonna barrel through and no, do what I do. But because we've done it so many times, I felt like I know what I'm doing here. You know, just you need to just light me and get the shot. <laughs> 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 well, that's the other thing, though, is with film, you don't get that immediate gratification because, right. like, the sound guys can't right. laugh, right? Because right. we're going to get a clean audio. So it's also, like, as actors, just trusting in our instincts and having to trust on each other and the team of it. Like, their job is to make us look good and they're going to get the best cut. So it's, like, such a huge other teamwork effort that happens. It was also really interesting, too, because a lot of the uh, um, crew and uh, the people in the production behind the scenes came come from a commercial world, right? So their whole life is about making things look perfect, even better than reality. And we're trying to make something that's spoofing, uh, you know, these super low budget seventies movies. And it would, I, I would try and tell them, like, I want this to look bad. <laughs> and, and they were like, Wait, I don't. What do you mean? And so. I, you know, I ended up with something that, you know, I was trying to make look sort of bad, but looks like a million dollar movie instead. But I, I'm, I'm not complaining. It looks amazing, but it was really funny. Or even one scene, I, I got a dance, my dance double. I actually cast the woman that was like four feet, three inches to play my, my double. And <laughs> to make it look obvious. And they worked so hard to shoot from below to make her look taller. <laughs> they were trying to make it match that somehow I, you know, those, those funny things, those funny things, you know, that is, is uh, you, that you wrestle with on trying to create something that has those, those weird um, nuances in it. But, but yeah, Nancy's right. I mean, we, we really, uh, we were all, we knew our characters so well that we could just do it. The other thing that was funny too, that I think people were, some of the crew was having issues with like, like Brandy and Champagne have a sex scene, a lovemaking scene. And and I think there was a lot of confusion around how the lovemaking we were making <laughs> because they, were, they weren't clear if we were supposed to be women or drag queens. I think there was still a, a, like a little bit of a, you know, because what we're doing, there's so many movies about and shows about drag queens, but we're doing a little more of the, you know, the Charles Bush school where we're, we're, we're playing female characters. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, that lends to nothing but like humor in the, in the translation, like, yeah. and, and people will see when they see the movie, like you, you, you play it very well, especially like when that 
maybe notion of like, is it a drag queen or is it a woman is brought up in like the subtext. It's it's quite funny. Wait, am I back? Did I miss anything? You're back. You're yeah. back. We were, I, mean, okay, right. I, I heard we're, you talking we're talking, about that. We, we were I had to leave. I was all up. We were talking about your love making scene. I like how Darcy put it as like, cause it really is like, instead of just coming up and being like, cause the movie's so raunchy. And I like love that you didn't call it a sex scene. It's a, it's a, you, you make love. You two make a love to each other. <laughs> I will say though, it, it, did, you tell the did you that that someone overheard like two guys talking about it outside? Like, what are they doing? Because they're like, we have our panties <laughs> on and we're like touching each other, like <laughs> they didn't get it, and like someone overheard them talking about it. They're like, what's going on? It's like they don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was an. It, it was a very interesting shoot and you know it, it felt i think for me and maybe i can't speak for others it was almost like going to a an intensive filmmaking yeah. For, yeah. we did it in 20 days like it was a very for you know to get all of that in a 20-day shoot we just didn't have enough money for any more and it, honestly even though i knew what we were organizing when i walked on set that first day it was late a bigger production than i was the scope of it I, I, it was overwhelming. There were tents and catering and trucks and people. Right. And, right. But, but Darcy, what, what time did you walk on set that first day? I was an hour day? late, so <laughs> I didn't get, I was on set. No, I was so embarrassed. I was an hour late the first day. I thought we show up and then it's gonna be like normal of like set and all the lights and everything. No, they were set up. Oh, it's just like, I was Time with so money on that film set. I was so ashamed. <laughs> I will say this too, after, you know, it, it's been an interesting thing because like, say for example, the character that Nancy plays, Debbie, she's sort of been like, you know, in the live stage show, she's the narrator. She comes on with the signs. Tell, we did, you know, we did this with no set. So that character sets the stage of what's going on. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of interjecting, almost like the silent Greek chorus. But what they also, what that character, Debbie did, was do this extensive pre-show stuff where she worked work the audience and 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 really get it immersive. Like we had strippers on poles and and Debbie would do these tragic lap dances and have a gross band-aid she'd peel off and give it to people. And you know, <laughs> and, you know what what we we what we're doing for Frameline is we're doing a pre-show to kind of emulate that, right? At the drive-in. So we're having dancers who are gonna work the cars and and Debbie's going to be there, but also Debbie is on the main screen. And what I've realized is that, you know, in moving forward, I feel like this movie has a pre-show and we've got all this great footage of Debbie. So, so there is a warm up, and I feel like that's how we're bringing the live aspect to, and, I, and I'd like to make that actually accompany the movie wherever it goes is this live warm up Debbie. limp noodle of a stripper. Um, <laughs> no offense, Debbie. Take her on tour to all the openings and premieres. Like <laughs> she's in well, Kansas. <laughs> no, the pre-show of her popping the ping pong ball out of her. That's the next show. That's the Temple of Poon. <laughs> Nancy, actually, Nancy, you recruited me to to strip at at Temple of Poon at Oasis, and I agree. It's like so much. That's what that's one of the things I'm looking the most forward to about the drive-in is that you do get like that. You just jump right back in the strip club. Now, I will say what I actually now I'm gonna, I'm going to tell the truth, Matthew. I had to talk Matthew into doing this role. And, and Wait we, a minute. You know, we oh, know. spill the beans. And we were doing well. <laughs> We were doing it right after Golden Girls. They, I wasn't in Golden Girls at the time. Um, they were just watching Golden Girls live. I know Matthew was tired. Matthew didn't know my 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 original work very well yet. Oh, I, I loved and respected you, of course. As a human being, but not my work. <laughs> um, and, and it took three phone calls and a lot of like arm twisting. <laughs> well, then, well, first it was the title. What's the show? Shit and champagne. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has hated the title from the beginning. No it was a me. bad day. Remember? It was like, it was like, um, actually, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> At first, I didn't know what I was getting into, but of course, I completely respected you. And uh, 
But um, you also just, haven't been the villain so much. This was a, a you hadn't been a, I guess baby Jane is, you were a villain as. But well. yeah, you know, and also just talking about, I, I had, having been a veteran of films, oh, I just, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was shutting up for as long as I could. No, but no, it was just interesting because I knew going into shooting this, I, having been there, it's a hurry up and wait of film and having 25 people practically on top of you, breathing down at you uh, silently. And my goal was always to break up the crew, but uh, you know, with the, the medium of film where you get, uh, yeah, what you were saying, uh, Andrew, oh, retakes and take two, take three, but you uh, always want to give it the best you've got. And, and there are so many other aspects involved with it, but um I just, what can I say? I'm just honored and so glad I said yes, Darcy. And then three three shows later and now the movie, it's like, how, how lucky can you get? So, and uh, the bonding of the cast, I, what is a, was a real rarity is uh, the ca it was the same cast in three iterations of Champagne. So uh, Temple of Poon and Champagne is disastrous. Is, was that, is that yeah, the correct? Yeah. yeah. So it was rare to have, it was like, you know, the Saturday Night Live players or SCTV crew, um, like a theater group. So I think we were well rehearsed and prepared going in to make the movie, but I know it's unsettling. We feed off the audience and there's nothing like a live audience and you're just not getting the reaction. <laughs> but um, I've seen a little bit of it and everyone is fantastically funny. So I'm just thrilled. I think that's my piece. <laughs> I think Darcy, if I'm correct, like some of our scenes were very early on, right? Like the first week, possibly, right? They were the first couple of days. <laughs> you, 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 right? So to, so to jump in it like that, and like like everyone's been saying, right? Without the live audience to feed off of, in this different group of people who you may not have worked with before, and then. Dangerous. That Right, with the words and the weird silence, and especially because I'm, <laughs> I'm in scenes with you, so you can't see, so you have to rely on someone else, and it just, and so we're doing our thing like we normally do, and it's like crickets, and you don't, <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. Oh, so, by the way, Darcy, when you're talking about other characters, I did play Big Sally. That's why I said, yeah, in the sequel. In the sequel. Yeah, we know who took up the entire stage and we had to let you know that there were other oh people that were I, also in the scene. This Matthew is very Martin. Funny. I, we couldn't I'm, get on stage because so, Matthew Martin wouldn't walk further on stage. Do you, want, do you want to tell that one? I was like, yeah, I was like, we're waiting to go. Nancy, you tell it. <laughs> That's a different show. That's not this movie. Get them for the sequel. That is another. That's, that's, that's <laughs> the <laughs> next year when we do that movie. Yeah. Is it? Are you talking about Temple of Poon? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, we're oh, just it's, it's all in the same ecosystem. Yeah, let's just say that we definitely be, we definitely became a family doing yeah. these shows, three three champagne shows over time. So uh, we were definitely bonded, and I think that translated well our camaraderie on film as well. I, and you know, we weren't, we were also comfortable and knew our parts so well and each other so well. So I think that that couldn't help but lend itself to what it is. It is, so. and, you know, and, I, and I think, you know, this, this film, bringing this film to life had, I mean, from the outside had a lot of hurdles, right? Like, especially it looked like something that, you know, I was told, you absolutely should do a short before you do a feature film. And, and that's not what happened. We just jumped right into a feature film without ever doing a short. But they said, you should, it's really, really hard to take a, you know, a stage production and turn it into a film. Oh, you absolutely shouldn't direct and star in the first film, right? Yeah. All these things. But because <laughs> we had done it so much and they were all still in it and, and because of the fan base, I don't, there was an ex, there was a level of confidence and courage in making this that I think if it was just you know had been me by myself making writing a script and then trying to get someone to produce it it wouldn't have had all you know everyone you see here plus more really was this giant foundation that that supported this and and all of the audience and really like I forget maybe it was Nancy who said it or James but like the audience is another character in this. And I feel like they're going to be that way. I hope that this can be seen in 
group settings. And because I really feel like it is an event film that, you know, where people can yell at the audience and, and, it, and, and or yell at the screen and participate in a way. And we've set it up. We've left those spaces for people. You know, every time Champagne says her name and everyone gives her a dirty look, she says, so I've been married a couple of times. It's none of your fucking business. The whole audience would yell, it's none of your fucking business. So I still tried to pace it in the movie so people could yell along with it. So we, and if it goes to streaming, I think you can even do like a how to shit in champagne and we can make packages oh, for people to have. smell a vision People could scratch and sniff. People can have home packages of like, how do we watch in champagne together as a party? What are the- How to Debbie at home. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And speaking I, of, of, go ahead, go ahead, James. Well, I just want to say a big, like everyone, one of the things I think is so evident is the artistic family that is created here. And I, I, you know, I got picked up for the, when we started doing it at Oasis and I was on my way to New York, this was going to be my last production. And then Darcy was like, there's going to be a sequel. I stayed for like an extra, like, you know, year or six months moved to New York, came back to do Disastrous, and then also came back to do the film. There's just nothing like this group of people. And it's actually a rarity in this industry to find a group of people that you love to create art with and 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 can be on the same level and especially like the the creativity that flows there. And and two, what Darcy was able to do with then open that magic from the smaller group of us as the ensemble actors to like the community, the larger community of San Francisco. It was so wonderful to see all these other folks getting the opportunity to be on a film set. And San Francisco has a lot of talent. And I, I, I Darcy was able to give so many people this opportunity. And I, I hope it's just the, the beginning of a new movement and moment of especially like queer, cinema and filmmaking and storytelling like there is space for what you know Darcy and the team are creating here I think you nailed it that's I mean I've been thinking about that ever ever since you know uh watch, watching shit and champagne like and and not to you know talk trash on any other cities but when you think stage maybe you think New York when you think screen maybe you think LA and I think this community aspect of this project in specific like speaks volumes to just working as performers in San Francisco, like we just have, you know, the community and and the relationship that you've all developed from working with one another, it doesn't matter if it's on stage or on screen because you can take it anywhere kind of thing. Yeah. And we're gonna take it to a drive-in in Concord. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, we've had a couple of other drive-ins reach out to-, to Oh, cool. Uh, and I'm like, is this gonna become like the drive-in tour? And <laughs> it's we, perfect for we, it. Pre-show, do we just go on tour? And you know, backing up a little bit too, I just also want to say, like, the course of us all working together, you know, we've done um, three of these. Um, then James did leave us and wasn't in bitch slap, but we all were in another show together. Um, and I, you know, I like yes, I I had kind of worked this one out a lot um, prior, but regardless working with the same group of people who you see here on the screen and, and really getting used to each other and understanding the comedy. That's a real specific kind of this slapstick that vaudeville, you know, Mel Brooks, Zucker Brothers kind of humor. Um, you know, I, I create a script, but so much comedy comes out when we're all in the rehearsal room and, you know, and, and I mean, it's um, it's magic. If we crack ourselves up, we're having. It's so fun to rehearse with people where there's really no mistakes. There's just mistakes that become fabulous accidents <laughs> to you know scenes. So you know, yeah, I, I, you there's the recipient of those accidents. <laughs> yeah. accident right there. Um, <laughs> so I gotta tell you, a long time ago, you're just thinking I'm crazy. Like probably. 15 years ago, I went and saw a psychic and they said, they said I'd become famous making film working with a troupe. And I Whoa. now I am actually seeing it take shape um, organically. So the psychic was right. Who's your psychic? I need to go see oh that psychic. God. I'll find out who that was. I, I forget. <laughs> Did your psychic so in New York City? What? Did your psychic mention anything about money? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> working on it. We're working on it. Um, one, uh, one last uh, quick thing I want to bring up, like just outside of the troupe, uh, you were able to get Alaska in in the film. How is it working with her? She's amazing. I mean, I, I really call you know her a friend at this point, but. Um, you know, we've had her at Oasis a number of times. She's guest starred in The Golden Girls with us. Um, and it was really fun to uh, get to work with her. And a total pro showed total up, pro. knew her shit. I like, I like yeah. dropped this line on her that took so much memorizing, like literally one minute before the take and she got it. Now, now LeMay did have to give up one of her characters to Alaska. So <laughs> Oh, oh, interesting. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but what? A, but better for it to go to, to her to co-sign on that. Like a lot of us have, like I'm not going to name any names, but I've definitely worked with some of those queens from RuPaul's Drag Race, and they're not all. I was, I was scared. I didn't really know Alaska going into it, and just what uh, a sweetheart and such a class act, yeah. and just like wonderful to work with and yeah. slap around. Yeah, no hard feelings, really. <laughs> <laughs> You know, more than anything, too, like what I hate is, you know, to really tighten this movie up, a lot of things did get left on the cutting room floor and a lot of fabulous people didn't make it in the movie. And I, I'm reminded that, that Tracy Ullman got completely cut out of Death Becomes Her. So it does. Oh, wow. didn't know that. that. But um, at, some, at some point, I want to make a director's cut. Oh, and you just have to. Get all the juicy stuff back in. But... But I am real proud. You know, I have a problem of um, everyone always often, always often says um, my stuff's too long. And we, we got this into a nice, tight 90 minute movie, which um, was a, a big challenge for me. Did you have well, to speed have up everyone's audio? <laughs> yes, six part mini series. Yes, and everyone talks twice as fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> But yeah, yeah cool. for the next one, I am uh, I am I am busy adapting the next one for the screen. So it's it's even there's there's a lot in that one from like running from boulders and falling in giant vats of perfume to <laughs> lady prison fights. Lady, lady prison. prison. <laughs> <laughs> That's how. <laughs> I'm also really happy just. Um, you know, from the very first time we did it in New York until even doing this film now, everyone said, you can't call it shit in champagne. You can't call it shit in champagne. Right, but right, you're, right. you know, and because of the title and you know what, it keeps being okay. And uh, I, at this point, we can't change the title because, you know, we got the shitheads. They wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> Um, to reprint all the merch. Yeah. <laughs> well, I honestly cannot wait for this drive in. I can't wait for all the shit heads to come out. And I think I think this has been really great. I think we've like covered kind of the history of shit and champagne for folks who might not be familiar with it. Um, and I am so excited to invite everybody out um, Thursday the seventeenth uh, at the Westman Solano Drive In. Uh, all that info, of course, is on the Frameline website. Please grab your ticket, ticket for a car, come see the fabulousness. And it was so great to catch up with all of you. Yay. Thank you, Thank you Andrew, for having Thank us. You, Andrew. Come see the movie. And Frameline. <laughs>